Welcome to this edition of Cranmer Studies. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? We finish this preface by Tyndale with his fresh air preface to the Bible. Note what the brethren said when they were detained in Egypt. We have verily sinned against our brother and that we saw the anguish of the soul when he besought us and we would not hear him. Therefore is this tribulation come upon us. By which example thou seest that conscious of evil doings findeth men out at last. But namely in tribulation and adversity their temptation and also desperation may the very pains of hell find us. Thus the soul feeleth the wrath of God and wishes the mountains to fall on her, to hide her, and if possible run from the angry face of God. Paragraph 21, mark also how great evils follow of how little an occasion Gyna goeth but forth alone to see the daughters of the country, and how great mischief and trouble followed. Jacob loved but one son more than another, and how grievous murder followed in their hearts. There are examples for our learning to teach us to walk carefully and circumspectly in the world of weak people that we give no man occasion to sin. Finally, we see what God promised Joseph in his dreams. <clears throat> Those promises accompanied him always and down, went down with him in, even into the deep dungeon and brought him up again and never forsook him till all at last was fulfilled. These are examples written for our learning, as St. Paul said to teach us to trust in God in the strong fire of tribulation and purgatory of our flesh, and that they which submit themselves to follow God should note and mark such things for their learning and for their comfort is the fruit of scripture and the cause why it is written. And with such purpose to read, it is the way of our everlasting life and to those joyful blessings that are promised to all nations in the seed of Abraham, which seed is Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. And we pick up with the preaching and worship in the period of the English Reformation, referring to the admonition given to the Corinthians, quote, this is from Cranmer, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye speak to the air. Cranmer writes, even so should the priests be God's trumpet to his church, so that if he blow a certain blast that the people may understand, they may be much edified thereby. But he gives such a sound as to the people unknown, it is clearly in vain, saith St. Paul. For he speaks to the air, but no man is better edified thereby. <clears throat> no one knoweth what he should do thereby. But be ye such enemies to your own country, he asks the Devonshire rebels, that you will suffer us to laud God, to thank him, and use his sacraments in our own tongue, but will enforce us contrary as to all reason. William Whitaker, writing in Elizabeth's reign, declared that he could recognize no greater holiness in one language than in another, and denied that the majesty of sacred things can be diminished 
by any vernacular tongues, however barbarous. barbarous. At the same time, he affirmed that nothing could be more dignified, majestic, or holy than the gospel. To the objection that by the use of the vernacular, the mysteries of the sacraments are wholly profaned, horribly profaned, which should be carefully concealed from the common people. He answered that neither Christ nor the apostles ever commanded that those mysteries should be concealed from the people. To conceal the design and purpose of the sacraments is to render them meaningless and unfruitful. These, therefore, should not be concealed but explained to God's people. The hiding of them is an anti-Christian device to fill the people with a stupid admiration of what they know not. He adduces evidence to show also that it was, this is from his disputation on the Holy Word, it was the custom of the primitive church for the whole people to combine their desires and assent with prayers of the minister, and not as with the papists amongst the priests to perform an unknown tongue. And to remain silent or murmur their own indifferent prayers. And now for Margot Johnson. And we have an article by Stephen Sykes on the baptism, baptismal formula or form or rite. You've heard that our Lord Jesus Christ hath promised in his gospel to grant all these things that ye have prayed for, which promise he and his party will most surely keep and perform. Wherefore, after this promise made by Christ, these infants must also faithfully for their part promise by you, by their charities. Why is so much emphasis laid upon the promise of the gospel? The historical lesson has doubtless much to do with the promissory emphasis of Luther's sacramental theology. But in Cranmer's baptismal liturgy, the theme of promise amounts to a structural element, not just a doctrinal illusion. The permeation of the theme of promise throughout the service suggests that the life of the participant itself is being structured by the liturgy. Quite apart from what may feature in this particular liturgy, we can observe from the standpoint of Christian doctrine that baptism, as well as the sacrament of initiation into the church, might well be expected to express a sense of the totality of the Christian's life within the church. We're putting it another way that as the sacramental incorporation into Christ, baptism might well be expected to elicit the complete sense of fellowship with him. As it is, Cranmer makes absolutely unambiguous what he hopes that baptism will achieve for all participants. In the opening rubric, he states that the point in public baptisms at main services is that every man present may be put in remembrance of his own profession made to God in his baptism. And hence, of course, the use of an English liturgy. Furthermore, the concluding exhortation to the godparents offers an explicit explanation of the content of the remembrance in the fall to the following effect. Remembering always that baptism doth represent unto us our profession, which is to follow the example of our Savior Christ and to be made like him unto him. That as he died and rose again for us, so should we which are baptized die from sin and rise again unto righteousness, continually mortifying our evil and corrupt affections, and daily 
proceeding in all virtue and godliness of living. This comprehensive summary of the Christian life constitutes the structure of the liturgy from first to last and is reinforced by constant repetition at every stage. But now we turn our attention to Bob McCulloch. Once the Lambeth Commission had disposed of Friar Watts, it turned its attention to the Calais affair. And the result was ludicrously predictable, both as a litmus test of the prevailing political atmosphere and as a contrast to the proceedings in July. Cranmer and the commissioners, Sampson included, reported back to Cromwell in November 11, 11 November, sneering at the probity of the conservative witnesses and virtually excusing all those evangelicals accused before them. Among them, Cranmer's long-standing Calais informant, Henry Tournay. Even those who could not be given an immediate clean bill of spiritual health should wait on further evidence before any decision could be made. By the time that Lyle heard about the twist of events, he would not be in any doubt as to its cause. From mid-October, as he had been, in, had been under instructions to make Calais respectable enough to please a royal bride from Cleves. The lady herself arrived at Calais on 11 December, and she then spent a fortnight there, doing her best to be agreeable to the king's welcoming committee, while the English Channel behaved at its worst, and the Lyles hovered discreetly in the background. Anne eventually braved the weather to land at Dover on December 27th, and she was welcomed in great style to Kent by the Archbishop and county dignitaries. She spent the next few days traveling up with Cranmer to the plan, lavish reception at Greenwich. The tale has often been told of Henry's first dismayed sighting of her at Rochester on 1 January 1540, and the subsequent desperate and unsuccessful attempts to wriggle out of the wedding at which Cranmer officiated at the chapel royal at Greenwich on 6 January 1540. The previous day Cranmer and Bishop Tunstall had ended the king's efforts to find a legal bolt hole by their joint conclusion that on the evidence available, there was no reason for the marriage not to go ahead. Faced with this unwelcome candor among his advisors across the religious spectrum, the king had no cho choice to, pr but to proceed against his will. However, the two bishops were just doing their job as honest diplomats. In the reality, there was only one man to blame for the disaster, Cromwell. All the theories about Cromwell's fall had been exhausted. Faction, diplomacy, and changing religious dynamics. The central reason remains this storybook misjudgment of the king's fantasy. Arthur Ennis, Cranmer, and the Reformation in England. Rocchio, God bless you too, Rocchio. Arthur Ennis and Cranmer and the Reformation. We're jumping around a little bit. He's been talking about the prayer book, the English Litany in 1549. That's for 1544, and now it looks like he's jumping back to the Ten Articles of 1546, which 
please nobody and annoyed everybody. A compromise doctrine. The first of these new statements of doctrine was the Ten Articles. And the purpose was to establish Christian quietness in 1536. It's not known who drew them up. There is in them no departure from accepted Roman doctrine. But the hand of Cranmer is apparent in the distinction laid down between ordinances having the sanction of biblical authority and those having the sanction of human authority only. All alike are treated as binding, but the distinction itself implicitly contains the suggestion that the latter, based on human authority, are not necessarily unchangeable. The necessary articles are acceptance of the Bible and the three creeds as the rule of faith, three sacraments, baptism, penance, and the altar, and justification. An explanation of the Eucharist, the real presence of the body and blood of Christ was affirmed, but they did not use the word transubstantiation, nor or set forth any mode of the presence. It's also noteworthy that the four other sacraments are omitted, marriage, matrimony, orders, confirmation. Their sacramental character was neither denied nor affirmed. Of course, that doesn't please the Anglo-Romanists but it would have pleased the Lutheran negotiators. The second part dealt with images, the honor due to saints, prayer and invocation of saints, rites and ceremonies, and purgatory, all which were to be accepted, but not to be abused. This is the Ten Articles of 1536, pleasing no one, and annoying everyone in leadership. The whole may be taken as an enlightened but not exhausted statement of educated opinion, which so far as it went, the most orthodox opponents of Luther and Zwingli would have raised no objection. That is not correct, Arthur. Swingley was way ahead of the game. <clears throat> Very poor statement by Mr. Innes. Needing correction. We turn to Leslie Williams on Emblem of Faith Untouched. And she is beginning to discuss Cranmer's doctrine. And she's bringing up Stokesley and Latimer and Ridley. And Cranmer gets himself into some land disputes. Exchanges of properties and old Harry and Cromwell are grabbing some of his land. And also how he is advancing English Bible, too. We cannot appreciate how big these changes were from Latin to English. In fact, Henry called all preaching to a halt from July to Michaelmas, except by bishops or in their presence. At once preaching started up again, the preachers were not allowed to interpret the articles. This is the Ten Articles, also 1536, that we just discussed with Ennis. Meanwhile, in response, a riot broke out in the north, a serious revolt against Henry's government. The spoliation of monasteries, the removal of silver images, shrines, and rich tapestries from churches 
hit the average churchgoer right in the solar plexus. Doctrine, politics, and theology stayed abstractions for the typical churchgoer. But taking away the familiar and the comfortable features of the churches dismayed and angered people. In 1536 to 39, 800 monasteries will be despoiliated. In Lincolnshire, 2,000 rebels stormed the justice of the peace on October 6th, demanding that Cranmer, Cromwell, and Latimer and other evangelical bishops and leaders be handed over to them to be burned as heretics or banished. It was called the Pilgrimage of Grace, started up north in Lincolnshire, which was even a little north of Thomas Cranmer's homeland in the Midlands. This movement spread. The people made up nursery rhymes reviving Cranmer's earlier epithet as an hostler and tavern keeper. Early in his tenure, ignorant Londoners set up bundles of hay in front of his home in order to make fun of him. As soon as the revolt broke out up north, authorities made assignments to get the situation under control. Cranmer was to supply 300 men and guard the Queen in London. Yes, Thomas Cranmer had soldiers, while Henry and Cromwell were going to take the field in person. Later, Henry changed his mind and had local dignitaries quell the trouble in their own country, country's hotspots. Cranmer resided in his palace in Ford during that bitter winter, sorting out the problems in his area. As he arrested and interrogated suspects, and he had jails. Lambeth has a jail. He discovered seditious problems amongst the monks of his Canterbury Priory, Christ Church in Canterbury a conclave of reactionaries who still resented his appointment. Hi, Mary, good to see you. Eventually, the Lincolnshire uprising called the Pilgrimage of Grace burned itself out. But the events may have cautioned Henry against making future religious changes. Again, the Ten Articles. A little bit of Lutheran whiffs that pleased nobody and it annoyed everyone. Henry quickly and rightly read the mood of his citizens. The common people only wanted the abuses of the church corrected. And certainly it was okay to take away the Pope's authority and his money grabbing operations in England. They were fine with that. As for the nobles, the only change they wanted was to get their hands on the lands of the closed abbeys. They wanted to be a part of the church's wealth, re wealth redistribution to their deep and greedy pockets. It was Cromwell, Cranmer, and the evangelical divines and scholars who wanted to press for further religious reform in doctrine, worship, and in piety. Hence, 1536-1537. Now we conclude our article on marriage vows in Thomas Cranmer, Paul Eris's Thomas Cranmer, and he's made a lovely study of the 900, 1,000 year old tradition of marriage and the similarity of the marriage vows that survived centuries. It comes down into many 
Protestant communion. So we'll finish this article uh, done by, who was the author of this excellent article? Not Brian Spinks. Excuse me. Cranmer's marriage vow. Stevenson is his name. Prof. Stevenson. So we break in here. This latter is the solution all adopted by the Alternative Service Book. That's the new Book of Common Prayer in England since 1980 replacing what had been used for 1980, over 400 years. Although other rites have taken the bull by the horns and made the vows equal, the American Episcopal Church since 1928 addressed the first question in the preliminary consent to the woman rather than to the man. Adjustments have been made to both the consent and the vow, usually the start and the finish, but the central parts of the service have stayed very much the same. And I still think the 1662 book of Common Prayer, The Marriage Rite, is exquisite. It was used at, it's his name, not Charles, Katie and Philip, uh, I forget the young guy's name. That's not Charles, Katie and. But they use the 1662 prayer book. Adjustments, okay. But there is one feature of our century that has served to highlight the critical character of these promises. In 1979, the American Episcopal book, Church, Church's Book of Common Prayer restructured the service so that it corresponded to the first part of Eucharist with proper Bible readings and a sermon, whether or not the Eucharist was celebrated at the climax of the rite. In order to sharpen the focus on the vows, the preliminary consent comes before the Bible readings and sermons, after which the couple come forward again to make their vows. This makes sense of the medieval tradition conserved by the manuals and by Cranmer that consent should be given in two directions to make the point abundantly plain that each partner is prepared to stand up in public and make the marriage promises before the other and in the face of the congregation. As a final episode of this chronicle, when Ordo Celebrandi Matrimonium was being drafted for the Roman Catholic Church, consideration was given to strengthening the form of consent in this the typical Latin edition. Rome had produced a passive form in the 1614 Rituale Romanum, now historical research, and we may hope the ecumenical movement. We're going to be talking more about that in the future. Ecumenism at the expense of biblical doctrine meant that the riches of the past could be looked at afresh. Although the final version of the order made passive consent after an interrogatory optional, the preference in the text is given to an active vow in clear and wonderful Latin, modeled deliberately on the serum and as follows. Ego equipio te Demaritum meum, et promito me tibi fidem serviturarum, inter prospera et adversa, in aigra in sana valitudine, ut delegam et honorum omnibus debus vitae mea. 
One may lament the absence of to have and to hold from the later Middle Ages, as well as to love and to cherish from Cranmer himself, and a stronger ecclesiastic ecclesiological accent would not have gone amiss, but the text is a landmark of its own. The story, of course, is not complete, for the way Christians marry each other varies according to culture and tradition, but this particular branch of the Western tradition occupies a significant part Cranmer himself bearing a great deal of responsibility as an inheritor who brought together and adapted the tradition as a theologian and who pushed it onwards into the coming Christian centuries. Cranmer and the marriage right. We now turn to Thomas Cranmer and the story about Catherine Howard, his fifth wife. And Cranmer passes a note to Henry at Mass in Hampton Palace that Catherine has been unfaithful. <clears throat> and Cranmer's been dispatched to hear her confession. To judge from Cranmer's letter to Henry, this seems to have been the original intention after hearing Catherine's confession. But such a solution was unsatisfactory to Henry, for it made it impossible to punish Durham. If Durham was married to Catherine, the question was a betrothal, whether there was intercourse before a marriage. It was no offense for him to lie with her. Though Parliament hastened to pass a statute which made it misprision of treason to fail to inform the king of the premarital incontinence of a woman whom he proposed to marry, it was doubtful if it could be held that this constituted an offense under law in force in 1540. It was therefore necessary to charge Durham with treason in having attempted to commit adultery with Catherine after her marriage to Henry. The fact that he had acted as her secretary for a short time after she became queen being treated as proof of the renewal of their former intercourse but this was impossible if Durham were Catherine's husband. Cranmer was therefore told by the council that the fact of the pre-contract must be suppressed as it would assist in her defense. On 12 November, the scandal was officially made public. Cranmer summoned Catherine's ladies and informed them about the Queen's misconduct with Durham before her marriage, but he said nothing about the pre-contract, typical Cranmer doing Henry's dirty business. He then dismissed the household from the Queen's service after ensuring that they were provided for and sent Catherine to Sion after depriving her of more sumptuous dresses and all the paraphernalia of royalty. And we'll pick this sad story up in our next occasion. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good to see all of you here. We'll be back again for evening prayer. Godspeed.